Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in Dentistry and more. So in prosthodontics, today's session is about denture bearing area in maxilla. So the denture bearing area uh, basically divided into uh, limiting structures and supporting structures and also the relief areas. So this session is about these structures that is a denture bearing area in maxilla so this will be a lengthier session we will be uh, discussing in detail about the various structures various anatomical parts its clinical significance and what are the clinical uh, changes or consideration uh, we should uh, do while making a uh, maxillary denture okay so let's see the details of denture bearing area and maxilla So the ultimate support for the maxillary denture are the bones of maxilla and palatine bone and the anatomical landmarks in maxilla are the limiting structures, supporting structures and relief areas. So this is a somewhat uh, like a maxilla, a edangelous maxilla. We have various anatomical structures. We'll start from here which is known as labial frenum then the incisive papillae the palatal rugae then the buccal frenum here also one buccal frenum is there then the crest of alveolar ridge maxillary tuberosity the hamlar notch it's a sulcus area just behind the maxillary tuberosity and the fovea palatini and this is the post palatal seal which consists of anterior and posterior vibrating lines and the buccal sulcus and the labial sulcus so each part has got importance in fabrication of upper denture so we'll start with the limiting structures limiting structures of maxilla so we have labial frenum then uh, labial vestibule then buccal frenum and buccal vestibule buccal frenum buccal vestibule then hamular notch then the post palatal seal and finally the fovea palatini these are the limiting structures limiting structures means these are the sites that will guide us in having an optimum extension of denture so as to engage maximum surface area without encroaching upon the muscle action. So we should limit the upper denture with respect to these areas otherwise the muscle action will act upon the denture and it will cause dislodgement that is why it's known as limiting structures. The boundaries should be limited or confined to these anatomical landmarks so we'll start with the labial frenum so the first one is labial frenum it is a single or double fibrous band covered by mucous membrane which extends from the labial aspect of residual ridge so this is the labial aspect of residual ridge and it extends to the lip okay to extends to the lip and labial aspect of residual ridge which contains no muscle fibers so what is the clinical significance of labial frenum it limits labial flange of denture and it has to be relieved uh, while making impression uh, in order to prevent the dislodgement of the denture and to prevent ulceration so it is seen as a v-shaped notch in the impression v-shaped notch okay And the next one is labial vestibule okay labial vestibule it is bilaterally present from the labial frenum to the buccal frenum okay so it extends from buccal frenum on one side to the other being divided into right and left by labial frenum and it has anteriorly orbicularis oris muscle 
ഓക്കെ ഓർബിക്കുലാരിസ് ഓറിസ് മസിൽ അൻറ്റീരിയർലി ആൻഡ് പോസ്റ്റീരിയർലി ബൈ ദ ലേബിയൽ ആസ്പെക്ട് ഓഫ് ആൽവിളാർ റിച്ച് ആൻഡ് ദ ക്ലിനിക്കൽ സിഗ്നിഫിക്കൻസ് ദ ലേബിയൽ ഫ്ലാഞ്ച് ഓഫ് ദ ഡെഞ്ചർ വിൽ ബി ഇൻ കംപ്ലീറ്റ് കോൺടാക്ട് വിത്ത് ദ ലേബിയൽ വെസ്റ്റിബ്യൂൾ ടു പ്രൊവൈഡ് എ പെരിഫറൽ സീൽ ഇൻ ദ ഡെഞ്ചർ നെക്സ്റ്റ് വി ഹാവ് ബക്കൽ ഫ്രീനം ഓക്കെ സോ ദിസ് ഇസ് അ ബക്കൽ ഫ്രീനം we have two buccal frenum one is on right side and one is on left side so it is a band of fibrous tissue overlying the levator anculi oris okay so levator anculi oris and which divides the labial vestibule from buccal vestibule okay so this is a buccal vestibule and this is a labial uh, sorry this is a buccal vestibule and this is a labial vestibule uh, so the clinical significance it has got uh, musculature muscular attachment this orbicularis oris orbicularis oris pulls this frenum forward whereas the buccinator pulls it backward okay so we need to give adequate relief uh, to prevent the dislodgement of the denture because it can move posteriorly as a result of buccinator the denture can go posteriorly because of this buccinator muscle action and anteriorly with the action of orbicularis oris okay it can move anteriorly because of the action of orbicularis oris and also the buccinator which may bring it posteriorly so it requires more clearance for its action than labial frenum so we have learned about labial frenum so we need to give more clearance than the labial frenum for buccal frenum because uh, it has got all these muscles that is levator ankle oris buccinator and also orbicularis oris so all these muscles have action it may bring it forward mesially backward so we need to give more clearance than labial frenum so the next one is buccal vestibule so buccal vestibule uh, it extends from the buccal frenum so this is a buccal frenum it extends from buccal frenum to the hamular notch so this is a labial vestibule this is buccal vestibule it starts from the buccal frenum to the hamular notch so it bounded externally by the cheek so here it we have the cheek muscles and internally by the residual ridge and the size of this uh, vestibule uh, varies because of the contraction of buccinator muscle okay so buccinator muscle depends the size of this vestibule so clinically why it is important because we need to keep the patient's mouth half open while taking the impression because opening of mouth during final impression causes the coronoid process so there will be coronoid process which will come forward or anteriorly which narrows the buccal vestibule so we need to keep the patient's mouth half open not completely open if we kept it completely open what happens the coronoid process come anteriorly and do the interference so we need to keep it half open so compared to this labial sulcus this buccal sulcus has more got more retention because the labial flange uh, compared to this labial flange of the denture this buccal flange has got uh, less interference so it can give more retention or maximum retention can be obtained from the buccal vestibule or the buccal flange of the denture so the next structure is hamular notch okay so hamular notch so hamular notch forms the distal limit of the buccal vestibule okay so the buccal vestibule comes here and it reaches here this is the distal limit of buccal vestibule okay it is behind the maxillary tuberosity so it is located between the tuberosity and hamulus of the medial pterygoid plate so there is always a muscle attached to it that is the pterygo mandibular raphe so the clinical importance is if the denture border okay is short of this hamular notch 
what happens is it will not have a posterior seal which result in loss of retention of the denture so if it is less than this hamular notch if it is coming like this it will have no retention that is the posterior seal is absent and what if it is going beyond the hamular notch if it is crossing this hamular notch what happens is the pterygomandibular raphe is pulled forward when the patient opens the mouth which causes a dislodgement of the denture so if it is less or if it is beyond oh, we have the denture retention problem so it should be adequate enough which will not interfere the pterygomandibular raphe will get the good posterior seal and good retention of the maxillary denture now we have the posterior palatal seal area or which is also known as PPS or post dam okay so as per uh, GPT definition it is a soft tissue at or along the junction of hard and soft palate on which the pressure along the physiological limits of the tissues can be applied by the denture to aid in the retention of the denture okay so it is a final posterior limit of the denture okay when we apply a physiological limit it gives good retention so it has got two parts the one is the post palatal seal post palatal seal and the second is a pterygo maxillary seal okay post palatal seal and pterygo maxillary seal and its extension anteriorly its extension so this green area is a post palatal seal anteriorly it has got anterior vibrating line posteriorly by the straight posterior vibrating line and laterally by three to four millimeter anterior lateral to the hamular notch anterior lateral to the hamular notch okay so this is the post palatal seal so it has got two structures that is the post palatal seal and pterygo maxillary seal so the post palatal seal it is a part of the posterior palatal seal area that extend between the two maxillary tuberosity so this is the tuberosity so these are the area which is between these two whereas a pterygo maxillary seal it is a part of the posterior palatal seal that extends across the hamular notch so these part the across the hamular notch okay so it was extending two to four millimeter anterior laterally so that part is known as pterygo maxillary seal okay so it is extending two to four millimeter anterior laterally to end the mucogingival junction on the posterior part of maxillary ridge so this is the post palatal seal and this part is known as pterygo maxillary seal so we need to learn uh, the vibrating line so vibrating line is nothing but an imaginary line across the posterior part of palate uh, palate marking uh, the division between movable and immobile tissues of the soft palate which can be identified when the movable tissues in moving it is based on the gpt definition okay so it is between the immobile and movable tissues of soft palate so denture should always extend one to two millimeter posterior to this vibrating lines so we have two vibrating lines anterior vibrating line which is cupid bow shape and the posterior vibrating line which is almost a straight line so anterior vibrating line which is an imaginary line lying at the junction between immobile tissues over the heart palate and the slightly mobile tissues of the soft palate so it is a cupid bow shape so it is like uh, the bow cupid bow shape because of the shape of this underlying bone so we must do valve salva manual when recording this anterior vibrating line so in order to get a good impression we need to 
perform, ask the patient to perform Valsalva manual. It is nothing but ask the patient to close his nostrils firmly and gently blow through his nose. Then we'll get the anterior vibrating line. Whereas the posterior vibrating line, this one, which is the imaginary line located at the junction of soft palate that shows limited movements and the soft palate that shows marked movement. So this is a hard palate and this is soft palate. So limited movements and marked movement. So the straight line. This is a hard palate and the slightly mobile tissues of soft tissue. Okay, this is limited and marked tissues of the soft palate only. And uh, the clinical significance of this PPS is it maintains the contact with the anterior portion of the soft palate during functional movements of uh, movements such as uh, mastication, deglutination or phonation. So therefore the primary purpose of the posterior palatal seal is the retention of maxillary denture and it uh, reduces the tendency for gag reflex as it prevents the formation of gap between the denture base and the soft palate during these functional movements and also it prevents uh, food accumulation between posterior part of the denture and soft palate okay and the last limiting structure is a fovea palatining these are the depressions or indentations situated on the soft palate on either side of midline. So these are the fovea palatini which is present on the soft palate on either side of midline. It is formed by coalescence of the decks of several mucous glands. And the position of this fovea palatini also influences the posterior border of the denture because the secretion of the fovea spreads as a thin film on the denture therefore helps in retention so the clinically uh, in patients with thick uh, ropy saliva the fovea palatina should be left uncovered or else the thick saliva flowing between the tissue and the denture which can increase the hydrostatic pressure and displace the denture if it is very uh, thin saliva it will aid in retention but if it is a very thick saliva we need to relieve the area to uh, help the denture to get maximum retention if it is very thick it might cause a dislodgement because of the hydrostatic pressure now let's move on to the supporting structures of maxilla it is primary stress bearing and the secondary stress bearing areas okay so primary stress bearing uh, hard palate and the posterior lateral slope of the residual alveolar ridge posterior lateral slope of residual ridge whereas the secondary stress bearing area is rugae maxillary tuberosity and alveolar tubercle so primary stress bearing area are heart palate and posterior lateral slope of residual ridges and the secondary stress bearing areas are rugae maxillary tuberosity and alveolar tubercle so we'll start with the heart palate so it is formed by palate and shelves of the uh, maxillary bone and the premaxilla so premaxilla will be here the uh, maxillary bone will be here so it lined by uh, keratinized epithelium and the horizontal uh, part of heart palate provides the stress bearing area these parts clinical significance this trabecular pattern in the bone is perpendicular to the direction of force so it is almost perpendicular to direction of force so making it capable of withstanding any amount of force without marked resorption so if a surface like this and we are applying force at 90 degree there will not be any resorption if this force angulation is slightly tilted it's an acute angle there will be resorption so it can withstand good amount of pressure without undergoing much resorption 
and the second uh, structure in primary stress bearing area is a posterior lateral uh, slopes of the residual alveolar ridge so this portion uh, lined by thick stratified squamous epithelium so it resorbs rapidly following extraction and continues throughout life at a reduced rate okay so there will be a continuous resorption throughout the life so still it can uh, support the structure and bear the masticatory forces so the vertical forces during uh, physiological activities like mastication falls on the denture and is transmitted posteriorly so these posterior lateral slopes of the ridge bears the force and that is why it is becoming mm, the primary residual uh, i mean primary stress bearing areas uh, now let's move on to the secondary stress bearing area that is rugae these are the mucosal folds so these are the rugae mucosal folds located in the anterior region of the palatal mucosa so in the area of this rugae the palate is set at an angle to the residual alveolar ridge and is thinly covered by soft tissue which contributes to the stress bearing area so clinically it is important because it is associated with the sensation of taste and the function of speech they assist the tongue to absorb via its papillae they also enable the tongue to form a perfect seal when it is pressed against the palate in making lingopalatal uh, constant stops of speech and rugae should not be displaced otherwise the rebounding may dislodge the denture and they provide anterior posterior resistance to movements of the denture and increased surface area which helps in retention okay now the maxillary tuberosity which is uh, bulbous extension so here it is the maxillary tuberosity bulbous extension of the residual alveolar ridge in the second and third molar area and it terminates in the hamilar notch and these areas are less likely to resorb so artificial teeth are not set on this tuberosity region and the tuberosity sometimes exhibit buccal undercuts if it is unilater unilateral it can be utilized uh, for the retention so those are the supporting structures now let's move on to the uh, relief areas so we need to relieve few areas such as incisive papillae we need to relieve incisive papillae and mid palatine raphe mid palatine raphe so this is the incisive papillae mid palatine raphe then the fovea palatini we already discussed fovea palatini then palatine torus if it is present palatine tori then the rugae area these are the relief areas so the first one is incisive papillae uh, this midline structure situated uh, just behind the uh, central incisors and there will be presence of incisive foramen here which lies immediately beneath the papillae so as resorption progresses it comes to lie near to the crest of the ridge so there will be nasopalatine nerves vessels pass through it so we need to relieve it so when making final impression uh, pressure should not be applied on this region because there is presence of lots of nerves and other structures then the mid palatine raphe this is a median suture uh, which covered by a submucosa so the mucosa layer is in close contact with the underlying bone for this region the soft tissue covering the median palatal tissue is non resilient in nature and may need to be relieved so if pressure is applied during impression making the denture base will cause soreness over the mid palatine raphe then the fovea palatini we already discussed why it is important because it consists of mucus glands and the hydrostatic pressure all those concept 
but it helps in determining the vibrating line then the palatine torus if palatine tori is present it should be relieved and rogue area or the irregular shaped ridges and uh, which is present in the anterior third of the heart palate it should not be disturbed while taking impression so these are the structures that is the denture bearing area of maxilla so we learned limiting structures supporting structures and relieving structures so limiting structures were uh, seven in number the first one was uh, the labial frenum labial frenum then the labial uh, vestibule the buccal frenum uh, and the buccal vestibule and the hamular notch and the posterior palatal seal and the fovea palatini and second uh, the supporting structure that is the stress bearing areas primary and secondary primary we have heart palate and posterior lateral slopes of residual alveolar ridges and the secondary stress bearing areas we have rugae maxillary tuberosity and alveolar tubercle and the relieving areas the incisive papillae then the mid palatine uh, raphe then the fovea palatini palatine torus and rugae areas so there can be many questions uh, be asked from this area the limiting structure supporting structures relieving area stress bearing area the anterior vibrating line posterior vibrating line the post palatal seal the valsalva manor and all the importance or clinical significance of each structure so it is a very very important chapter in prosthodontics so i'll come up with the denture bearing area and mandible in my next session hope you understood the concept of this uh, bearing area of maxilla thank you